our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. In the winter of 1952, a massive storm descended on the New England coast. It was a nasty northeaster. Winds in that area quickly reached forces approaching Category 1 hurricane strength. Some of the waves were recorded in excess of 20 to 30 feet. It was not a good time to be on the open waters, and most sailors had simply taken good preparations, had either left the area or had found shelter in a nice safe harbor somewhere. But as it often happens, there were a few ships caught in that storm. There were a few ships that, for one reason or another, simply did not make it out of the area, that simply did not make it to safe haven. There was an oil tanker, an oil tanker named the SS Fort Mercer, that was caught in that storm. She was disabled, and the ship was floundering. There was a crew aboard that ship that needed to be rescued. And the United States Coast Guard responded the way the Coast Guard does. All up and down the eastern seaboard, ships and planes, helicopters were forced into service to rescue those sailors on the Fort Mercer. The Coast Guard was busy, and they had thrown virtually everything they had into that rescue operation. But as that rescue operation was underway, Coast Guard stations began to receive a second call, another distress signal, a T-2 tanker, which has a particularly fond spot in my heart since my dad served on those T-2 tankers during World War II. A T-2 tanker named the SS Pendleton was caught in that storm. The Pendleton had had a repair done to her hull. A bad fracture had been welded shut and the stress of the storm, the waves battering against that ship, began to break it apart and literally the SS Pendleton, Pendleton split in half. The front half of the ship went down, taking the captain and seven men with her. But 33 men survived. 33 men were on the stern, the second half of that ship. And it was still afloat. Miraculously, they were still there. The winds were fierce. The waves behemoth. And unless they risk, rescue came, unless someone came to their relief, it would only be a matter of time before that storm and the sea would claim them. The Coast Guard already had the majority of their cutters and their aircraft in that region committed to that first rescue, the rescue of the Fort Mercer. There was precious little available left for a, a major rescue operation. All that was left was a small 32-foot lifeboat at Chatham Station with a very small contingent of men. And facing a daunting task, four anxious and brave men took that small boat into the raging surf. Four men, anxious and fearful, left the safety of the harbor in search of the SS Pendleton. When we read Paul's letter to the church at Corinth, we may actually be hearing and reading one of the first recorded widespread financial appeals in the church. In chapter 8 of 2 Corinthians, Paul is encouraging his church that as they are about giving to relieve the poverty among the Christians in that famine-stricken area of Judea. Paul is speaking to the church, and he speaks of generosity, the generosity of the people. Generosity is a word that we often use in, in one way or another. I remind us all that generosity is not something that depends simply on the size of our bank accounts and what we're able to do, but it depends on our readiness to open our hearts, to open our hearts to the needs of others and to share with others what we have. We may share our finances, that's true, and that's good, 
but we share our time and our energy as well. And here at First UMC, we often share our facilities with others when the need arises. Yesterday morning was the first Saturday of the month. It's a month that we've designated as a, a time to, to cook breakfast for the homeless in our community and to open this facility to allow them, those that have spent the night living on the street or the week, a chance to take a, a shower, a hot shower, if they so desire. Brothers and sisters from La Trinidad United Methodist Church and Wesley Harper United Methodist Church and First United Methodist Church come together here. And yesterday morning we were cooking breakfast, pancakes and sausage. And I had already begun to think, you know, we've had not a lot of response to this ministry so far. There's been times when no one came. But when we arrived yesterday morning, there was a young couple sitting outside waiting for us that had spent the night sleeping in a laundromat. They needed this shelter. They needed this harbor. They needed this safe place yesterday and the doors were open for them did you know that first united methodist church of Seguin is registered as an emergency medical needs shelter if uh, an emergency descends on the area whatever it might be and refugees flee the coast if the shelters in the larger cities begin to fill we're one of the overflows we're here to welcome those fleeing natural disasters. Mops, mothers of preschoolers, meets monthly in Hirholzer Hall. Ask our guests. So does the Wesley Foundation from TLU. They have a room upstairs that they, are, that they use every week. Whenever the need arises in this community, this church opens its doors for organizations that need a meeting space. It's in, true. We do feed the hungry. We provide blankets for the homeless. We assist in the Christian cupboard and other feeding ministries throughout the community. We drill water wells in third world countries and we support Christian missionaries overseas. And yes, we fund our youth and our children's ministries as we do many other ministries. But this church is also a place where people gather. We gather not only for worship, but for many other reasons as well. You might say that this church is not unlike a Coast Guard station. We're preparing to be sent out when needed. During the Second World War, one of the most important jobs was uh, fell to men and women who packed parachutes for soldiers. Parachutes for soldiers. These parachutes were packed by hand, and it was a very tedious, it was a painstaking, repetitive, boring job, day in and day out. The workers would crouch over their tables, their sewing tables, and they cut the material, and they stitched for hours on end every day. The endless line of fabric was all the same color. They cut the fabric, they sewed it, then they folded it, they packed it, and they stacked those parachutes, all ready to be strapped on someone back, someone's back that needed it at a certain time. How do they do it? How do you do a job like that, day in and day out, that takes so much time and energy that just becomes mind-boggling at times? Well, they stood it because every morning before they began their work, those people working in that factory gathered as a group together, and they prayed. And one of the managers reminded them that each parachute that was strapped on someone's back would save that person's life. And then they were asked to think, to consider, that as they sewed, as they packed those parachutes, how would they feel if that they knew that the parachute they were packing was going to be strapped on the back of their son, on the back of their father, or their brother? And the truth was, they really were. They really were. I give thanks this morning for the USS Tarbell. Isn't that a horrible thing for a ship? <laughs> the USS Tarbell, a destroyer of the line. Not quite as fancy as the one you sailed on, Sean. But the Tarbell came to the rescue of my dad's ship when it was torpedoed off South America during World War II. 
I give thanks for those that go in harm's way. It says, whatever the need arises, we will be there. Imagine people. Imagine people working feverishly without complaining because someone connected what they were doing to a larger picture. That manager that managed to instill in his workers that what you were doing in packing those parachutes has a far greater good than you can ever probably imagine. It has a larger mission. It has a larger mission. That's who we are here at Seguin First. We're a band of brothers and sisters on a faith journey. We don't always pack parachutes. Sometimes we just cook pancakes. We don't always man, man lifelines. Sometimes we just collect hygiene products. But there are times that we really do move forward in dramatic ways. We're a band of brothers and sisters on a faith journey together, doing the best we can to put one foot in front of the other. And we work together. We share what we have, we support one another and the work of the church to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. By now, many of you have probably received a letter in the mail. A letter and a, and a pledge card for the 2017 budget year. This is the time of the year for us to stop and reflect seriously about the coming year. To make preparations to begin to underwrite the ministries of this church for the coming year. Prayer is a critical factor, and I invite you to please spend time in prayer about the decision you make. But remember this, prayer doesn't pay the bills. That's you and me. People do. Please take time to prayerfully consider how you're going to support the work of the church for this coming year. And next week, as Pastor Andy is here with you to lead you in worship in the consecration of those pledges, be ready to respond to the work that we are called. As the men of the SS Pendleton shivered and prayed on that piece of a broken ship that they were huddled together on, as they rode out the storm on that battered ship in that dark, stormy night, they wondered if anyone was going to be there for them. They wondered if anyone was going to come to their assistance. But a small light, one small light in a very dark night, sent the answer that we're here. Miraculously, that 32-foot lifeboat from Chatham Station with four anxious and fearful sailors aboard found the remnant of the SS Pendleton. They pulled alongside. Those men on that ship looked down at that little boat and they said, what good is a little boat going to do us now? That boat was designed to carry about 12 to 14 people and there, there were 33 survivors on deck. The men of the lifeboat said simply, we will either all live or we will all die. And they found a way. I wish I could say they found a way to put all 33 of those men into their boat. They only got 32. The sea took one of them, unfortunately, that they were not able to rescue. But 32 of those 33 men got there. When they arrived back home, as they were coming in. The storm had knocked off the power in that little community and the lights of the harbor were out. And so the men and the women drove their cars to the bayfront and lined the front and turned on the headlights of their cars. A light breaking forth in a dark and stormy night to say, we're here. 
That's First United Methodist Church of Seguin. A church that looks out to this community and says, in dark and stormy times, we're here. Amen? Amen. I invite you as your first response to the word this morning to stand as we affirm our faith together.